Welcome. The purpose of this video is to take a look at a very, very important form of monetary policy, and that is open market operations. Open, our, open market operations are conducted by the Federal Reserve System, and what's, what the Federal Reserve System is doing is it's buying and selling government bonds to alter the level of reserves in the banking system. Now, it's very, very important to know that the Federal Reserve System and the federal government are essentially two different entities. Yes, the Federal Reserve System was created, it was created by the Congress, and the Congress is part of the federal government, but the Federal Reserve System isn't. It's a central banking system that exists outside the federal government, authorized by Congress, its leaders appointed by the president, but the Fed is, is not part of the executive branch, the legislative branch, or the judicial branch. So when the United States, through the Congress, created the Federal Reserve back in 1913, it desired to have a central bank that was operating independently of the politics that would be found at the federal, federal level in the national government. So that's important to know. Now, what the Fed is going to be doing in open market operations is buying and selling government bonds. So these government bonds, we'll need to talk about what a bond is because government bonds are, are issued by the government. And then the Federal Reserve System, through the buying and selling of these bonds, alters the level of reserves in the banking system. By altering the level of reserves in the banking system, the Fed is then able to alter interest rates. And by altering interest rates, ultimately the Fed is able to affect consumption levels, investment levels, GDP levels, and even the price level. So what we can learn here is that the Federal Reserve System is probably one of the most important macroeconomic actors in existence. Yes, the federal government also has policies it can enact to affect the macro economy, but this entity, this central bank called the Federal Reserve System, coined by, uh, the nickname the Fed, the Fed has tremendous powers uh, to also alter macroeconomic outcomes. Okay, so let's dig in. And I wanna scroll down here and actually first talk about what a bond is. And to understand what a bond is, we need to go back to the complex circular flow model and look at the government sector. And I'm gonna switch my color ink here to red. By the way, I strongly encourage you to take notes. Okay, the, the way you're going to internalize this information is to take it out of the e-workbook or off the video and get it into you. And one way you can do that is by writing it down and jotting down notes and jotting down the calculations and things like this. Okay, way back in unit one, topic five, we talked about the complex circular flow and the government sector, the business sector, here's the government sector, Here's the government sector. We've got the business sector and the household sector. So you notice I haven't drawn the entire model in here. I want to only focus on those areas which are pertinent to what we're talking about here. Now, we know that the government basically does two things with money. There are government purchases, and this is where government buys, buys things. So military systems, it can buy military systems, it can buy office equipment, it can buy buildings, it can pay for workers. All of these things that the federal government pays for, those are government purchases. The government also engages in what we call government transfers. So government transfers are where the government actually uh, gives money back to the household sector. For instance, Social Security. Uh, the federal government taxes households. Uh, it's a Social Security tax. And that tax raises funds to pay for people who are retired. Um, and that's a transfer. It's a welfare payment. But people have to pay taxes to finance that transfer program. So Social Security is an example of where the government takes money that it's collected either through taxes or borrowing, turns around and gives it back to someone 
in the form of a welfare payment uh, to help that person. Now, how does the government finance its purchases and its transfers? That becomes the question. Well, one way is with business taxes. So business taxes are, are a way the government can do that. Now, we know, we studied this way back in Unit 1, we know that business, businesses really ultimately can't be taxed. Yes, on paper they're taxed, legally they're taxed, but ultimately those business taxes are passed on to consumers in the way of higher prices and so on. But nevertheless, on paper, businesses pay taxes. Also, the household sector pays taxes. These are called personal taxes personal taxes. Now, if, if those taxes are sufficient to cover these purchases and transfers, then the government has balanced its budget. But the federal government, in particular, has not balanced its budget in decades. The federal government, each and every year, runs what we call a deficit, which means its government purchases and these government transfers are larger than the taxes that are collected. So the government has to borrow. Where does it borrow from? It borrows from the credit market. So here's the credit market. I'll use a different color here. And this is called net government borrowing. How does the government borrow? It borrows by selling bonds. So when the federal government wants to borrow, and it does want to borrow, because it, it does not at this stage raise enough tax revenues to cover its purchases and its transfers. So it's going to have to, yes, it has to tax households, it has to tax businesses, and it also has to what? It has to borrow, all right? Now, by the way, just a quick, just a quick reminder, this was back in Unit 1, Topic 5. I don't wanna, I, I just don't have time to spend a lot of time on this. But the, this is a flow. This is the borrowing that's happening in a particular year. The national debt is not a flow. It's a stock. It's the accumulated borrowing that has occurred over all of these years. So right now, the national debt is $31 trillion, thereabouts. And it's going up every moment. I mean, the federal government is constantly spending at a rate which is greater than the rate of taxation. And so those flows, the, you know, the, the, the flows that are happening here end up leading to this net government borrowing flow. This net government borrowing is basically an annual amount that is added to the national debt, okay, at the federal level. Now, states also borrow, municipalities also borrow, but they generally, re, uh, they generally pay, uh, balance their budgets. So they're not running annual deficits, at least on paper, every year. So the, the, the largest borrower um, in the United States is the U.S. federal government. And again, how does it do that? It does that by selling what? By selling bonds. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit of, uh, I'll adjust the picture here. So I'm going to scroll this up and let me get rid of my color thing here. Okay, <clears throat> now the question is, how does a bond work? The bond is going to have a face value. The face value is the amount borrowed. So this bond has a face value of 1,000. So the government is borrowing $1,000 when uh, it issues this bond. This bond is also going to have an interest rate. Actually, this is called the coupon rate. Some of these terms are finance terms. You're learning some finance here, some bond finance, as you learn economics. And this is really the interest rate. Okay, so this is what the interest rate is going to be over the life of the bond. There's also going to be a, um, a maturity uh, number here. Actually, it will be a date, but I just put five years here. Uh, this this uh, video is being actually produced in June of 2023. So if we were, uh, if the government were issuing a bond this month, June of 2023, this bond would mature when? In June of 2028, okay? 
So a five-year bond, it, th this bond would actually have June of 2028 on it. But I just put a five years here to indicate this is a five-year bond. So then if we come down a little bit further, we see that I've identified a, a time period one, time period two, all the way through time period uh, five. I guess I put an extra dot in there. And if you think about this, at time period zero, the bond is issued. So the bond is issued at time period zero. When it's issued by the government, these bonds are actually issued through major brokerage houses, major um, companies that actually sell bonds and stocks and things like that. And these are companies that are on Wall Street. These are called primary, uh, primary providers. And the government works through a, a, a small number of those to get those bonds issued, to get those bonds sold, okay? One year after the bond is issued, it will pay an interest a payment of $50. You go, well, how'd you get that? Well, 1,000 times 5% is $50, okay? So it's just a simple math question here. Take the face value times the coupon rate, and then you get the interest payment. This is annual. Actually, uh, this payment is divided into two parts. It's actually paid twice, twice a year. So it's uh, actually two $25 payments, but we're just going to put them together and say $50 a year. So one year after the bond is issued, the payment will be made. Uh, uh, two years after the bond is issued, another payment will be made. Three years after the bond is issued, another payment will be made. In year five, when we get to year five, interest will again be paid and the principal will be repaid to the person who is holding the bond, the, the um, bond holder of record. Now, th when the bond is first sold, it is sol sold through the primary market, the primary market. But these bonds can be sold a number of times before they mature. They, they could be sold every year, they could be sold every month. So people buy bonds and sell bonds, and somebody might buy a five-year bond and think, okay, I'm gonna hold that for five years. But you know, two years in, after two years, this person may say, hey, I can't drive a bond, I need a new car, I'm gonna liquidate some of my bond portfolio, some of my assets that are bonds, liquidate them, what does that mean? Turn them into cash, or turn them into, I should say, a deposit, and then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna go buy a car with that. But whoever buys that bond is now going to be the bondholder of record, and they're then going to earn the interest payments, and they're going to then get the principal repaid to them uh, at the end of the maturity date. Okay, so these bonds get traded; they get traded, uh, and you know, I don't know the percentage of people that hold the bond to maturity. You know, buy it, buy it up front, hold it to maturity, but it's not a very large number. Bonds get they turn over a lot. Uh, the U.S. government bond market is one of the largest financial markets in the world. There, there is, you know, 32, going on $32 trillion with a, worth of U.S. government debt out there. That's the national debt. That's, those are the bonds outstanding at this point. And these bonds are held by foreign countries, Japan, number one foreign holder, China right behind Japan, held by lots of different people all over the world. And these bonds uh, are traded, billions of dollars being traded you know, daily, okay? So, you know, the market is very, very liquid. This is a very, very liquid market. Where bonds are traded after they're first sold is called the secondary or open bond market, okay? And again, these are very, very safe. I'm gonna move this up a little bit for you. These are very, very safe. Um, and why are they safe? Because it's the U.S. government. The U.S. government is one of the strongest governments, at least at this point in time, in the world. The government has not uh, reneged on its debt. Um, we, we hear of debt ceilings and we hear of the government perhaps failing to meet a debt payment and this sort of things. This is usually just political drama 
the U.S. government makes its payments on its bonds. And yes, it would be a crisis if the U.S. government stopped, you know, um, didn't make some bond payments because it couldn't afford it. That would be a huge problem. That would be a huge problem, but it's never happened. And the likelihood of that is very low because the U.S. government can tax, raise taxes, and it has guns. I hate to be so blunt about that, but it has guns. So it can enforce its tax laws. It can collect what it sets out to collect. And um, so these bond payments are gonna be made. That's my point. So there's very little risk here. These are very safe. They're also, I'm gonna make a note here, very liquid. They're easily converted back to money and uh, people love to hold them. They don't pay the highest levels of interest because they're safe. So uh, financial investments that are riskier generally have to put a higher interest rate on them uh, for them to actually be sold. So for instance, if the Ford Motor Company wants to sell a bond, it's going to have to pay, if the, if the federal government is paying 5%, well, Ford will have to pay 5% plus some risk premium. Maybe they have to put 6.5% or 7% on their bonds. And the, the riskier the issuer of those bonds, the higher the interest rate has to be because it's, it's more probable that the person will not repay the debt. So uh, the interest rates on government bonds are considered to be risk-free rates that you can get for saving out there if you're willing to tie up your funds for a period of time. They're very liquid, easily traded, and they're very safe. Okay, now, we haven't even gotten to monetary policy yet. You go, wow, yeah, I had to do the bond lesson to basically let you know what's going here. Now, the Fed, again, this is, a, I overemphasize this, but it's so important. People get so confused. They confuse the Fed with the federal government, and all sorts of bad things start to happen when that happens. The federal government and the Fed are two different entities. When the Federal Reserve System, the Fed, buys bonds in, in the secondary bond market, it is buying them and putting them on its books, and you'll see how this then impacts the level of reserves in the banking system. But this is not the primary bond market. The bonds have already been sold. The Fed is going into the secondary bond market and buying these bonds to conduct monetary policy. Okay, so let's say the Fed, I'm just going to make up an example here. I've jotted down a few notes. And uh, let's say the Fed decides to buy $50 million, $50 million in U.S. government bonds. How would that affect the Fed's books and how would that affect the banking system's books? Well, when the Fed buys $50 million in bonds, it now shows those bonds as an asset on its books because bonds are something of value that the Fed is holding. Now, here is the interesting part. When the Fed buys those bonds, it creates a deposit in the banks of those people, those bond sellers. So, Excuse me, that's not correct. I'm going to erase that B there. So this is going to be a deposit. So $50 million is spent on these bonds. The Fed now has those bonds in its possession on the asset side of its balance sheet. Those bond sellers, the people that sold the bonds to the Fed, and these bonds could have come from multiple parties. Lots of people on a given day could be selling bonds. And they, they need to be paid for those bonds. So $50 million is deposited into the bond, sellers, the bond sellers' accounts. Now, here's the interesting thing. This deposit did not come at the expense of another bank. It's not like this came out of someone's account and went into someone else's account. This $50 million deposit is new. It's created. I mean, it's new. It's, it's newly cre created. Okay? Newly created. This is newly created.
created money. You go, I can't do that. Well, no, you can't. The Constitution doesn't give uh, individual citizens the right to, to print up money. But does the Federal Reserve System have the right to create money? The answer is yes, because that right was delegated to the Fed. If you look at the U.S. Constitution, the U.S. Constitution says Congress has the right to mint and coin money, to produce money. Congress delegated that right to the Fed in 1913 and has not taken that right back. Could take it back, but has not taken that right back and allows this independent central bank headed by someone appointed by the president and the board is also, the bo that board of governors is also appointed by the president and you can read about that in your e-workbook. But that Fed, the Fed has the right to create money out of thin air. And in fact, when the Fed buys bonds, that's exactly what it's doing. It's actually called monetizing. What's happened here is the Fed has monetized, monetized government debt. You go, what do you mean monetized it? Taken possession of the bonds and essentially put into circulation, took these bonds out of the bond market and put another asset in the bond, not in the bond market, but in the accounts of the bond sellers, that is money. Took bonds, a non-money asset, out of the bond market and put money into the banking system. That's called monetizing government debt. Now, if you're going, whoa, yeah, this is how it's done. I don't know, maybe you imagine that the government, you know, puts uh, p p uh, currency in large, large canvas bags and flies, flies over major metropolitan areas and drops these canvas bags and lets the, you know, lets the currency just kind of fly out there and people, well, we know that isn't the way the money supply's increased. We, we don't go around and pick up money off the street, okay? The government doesn't drop currency over cities with helicopters. How does money get created? That's an interesting question, and this is how it happens. It's done through the banking system. Deposits are money. This $50 million deposit will lead to $50 million uh, an additional $50 million in reserves. So these reserves were just created. And these reserves will show up here on the Fed's books to kind of close the accounting loop as a liability. You'll read about this in your e-workbook. But the key idea is what the Fed has done is it's pumped more liquidity into the banking system. Why, do we, why, does that, why is that important? Because we know that when banks have reserves, they can create what? They can create loans. So these additional reserves in the banking system are now loanable. And as these get loaned out, and banks will loan them out, they're gonna create a multiplier effect of deposits. So the effect on total deposits will be much larger than that initial $50 million deposit. We talked about the money multiplier, the deposit expansion process back in Unit 2, Topic 5. Now we're applying it to this case of monetary policy. So let's just suppose that the actual money multiplier is 4. That's just given. We're just giving you that data. And that's what the current multiplier is near. Current data shows uh, since, since 2009, uh, the, the actual money multiplier, if you look at actual data, has averaged around four for M2. So if the Fed increases the monetary base by 50 million, look, this, this is the increase in the monetary base. This is the change in the monetary base. then this is going to increase, could increase the actual money supply if things stay in the same kinds of patterns by $200 million. This is called monetary policy.
what the Fed is doing is altering the level of bank reserves by pumping more reserves into the banking system through these open market operation purchases and in doing so allowing the banking system then to work with those additional reserves and create more more money. Now of course if if there's more deposits in the banking system and more reserves then it's likely interest rates will drop. Credit conditions will ease. It'll be easier to get a loan. Now you can run this in reverse. I'm not going to draw all of this, but if the Fed wants to tighten credit conditions, pull reserves out of the banking system, you know, why would it want to do that? Why would it want interest rates to go up? Well, maybe it's afraid of inflation. Maybe spending has been too hot and credit conditions have been too easy and we're starting to see prices go way up. We'll be talking more about this later in Unit 3. Well, the Fed would sell some of the bonds it holds. So you just reverse this. And what would happen here? If the Fed sells bonds, then this would be a minus sign over here. Now let me just change my... Uh, so if the Fed were to sell bonds, you don't have to write this on your notes, but just, just look here. Then this would be a negative $50 million in bonds. Whoever bought those bonds from the, the Fed would see their deposits go down by $50 million and that would decrease reserves in the banking system by 50 million. This, of course, would also drop by 50 million because this is basically a mirror. This 50 million here is showing, 50 million showing up on the banking system's books as an asset is showing up on the Fed's books as a liability, okay? And so really what you'd be doing is you'd be changing this monetary base in the negative and that would actually cause the money supply to contract. Okay, so when the Fed wants to increase the monetary base in the actual money supply, it buys bonds. And when it wants to decrease the monetary base and the actual money supply, it sells bonds. Okay, all right, this is, this is good for right now. Uh, there's going to be uh, more video coming um, on topics one and topics two in unit three. But this is material from topic one in unit three. And one of the things you need to learn is about open market operations and how they are actually conducted. I hope this has been of help to you. And I look forward to seeing you again in a future video. Take care.